In this section, I'm going to talk about optimates and populares, which is uh, a pair of terms that uh, crop up quite commonly in discussing late Republican politics, um, so commonly that you might think that it, it is the key to understanding uh, how late Republican politics works, or at least what the essential conflict is, the conflict between these two things, whatever they are, optimates and populares, is one of the drivers of so much political conflict. Um, optimates uh, means the best men, uh, the best individuals, uh, best how defined, uh, self-defined is the, the answer. Um, these aren't people who've, who've been uh, voted the the best men in some kind of online poll. They've just decided that they are. Um, and uh, by calling themselves the best, they follow in a long tradition of ancient politics, which uh, co-identifies a particular conservative political stance with a claim to moral goodness. If you go right back to fifth century Athens, um, the Aristoi, the best men, were the elite, the rich, the conservatives, and the poneroi, the scoundrels, were the poor. And uh, this idea that um, the wealthy, those, those who are the establishment, the haves, uh, try to back up their political power by uh, a claim to monopolizing moral goodness is something that runs right the way through uh, the ancient world. And it recurs uh, in the, this late Republican context where in the first century BC people start describing themselves as optimates. Now, optimates is a subset of a similar group, the Bonnie, the Bonnie are the good men. And, and they call themselves the good men not because they are good. If, if you look at the lives of most of them, they're clearly anything but good. Um, but they arrogate to themselves, they take to themselves uh, a claim to be morally good because that buttresses the fact that they are in a position of inherited political power. And people might say, why are you in power? Why am I not in power? And the answer, very basically boiled down, is um, I'm good and you're not. Uh, the application of the, the, the base or the worthless to the masses is obviously not something that the masses subscribe to themselves. We don't think that the Roman people went around calling themselves uh, wicked men, as Cicero does, improbi, or base or worthless, or any of these other um, moral terms. They were the populace, or the plebs. Um, populares, which is, is, becomes in a way the polar opposite of uh, optimates, or boni, is a different kind of word. Interestingly, it doesn't have moral connotations. Uh, the populares don't seem to want to play this game of uh, competing over the moral high ground. Um, possibly because they want to make the point that this is, is actually bankrupt uh, as uh, an exercise. Um, popularis originally means someone who belongs to your populace. So uh, if you have a British passport, uh, anyone else who has a British passport is what is your popularis. They, they belong to the same populace, the same people as you. And this is how Cato uses the term, uh, in the, the elder Cato uses the term in the beginning of the second century. At a point in the early first century, maybe the late second century, but, but it's not attested before the early first century, popularis starts to mean something else. Popularis means someone who supports the interests of the people. And it becomes something that is opposed to optimates. And we could take a text like Cicero, Pro Sestio, in the latter th uh, last third of, of, of the Cicero's Pro Sestio. He stops defending Cestius in court and enters into a long disquisition about populares and optimates. And a lot of the canonical view that we have of the opposition of these two groups um, depends on, on or, or comes from Cicero's discussion in the Pro Cestia. And what he's trying to do there is to subvert 
the idea that the Optimates are a bunch of exclusive toffs, that they're, they're basically the Bullingdon Club, and that on the other hand, the Populares, uh, this the view Cicero is trying to subvert, the Populares are reformers with a moral conscience and a political conscience who have got into politics because they want to promote the well-being of the people. And what he says, in fact, is that anyone can be an optimate as long as their political sensibilities are right. So you can be um, a dinner lady or a street sweeper, um, or you can be unemployed, or you can be a freedman, a uh, former slave. But if you identify with the political status quo, if you believe in stability, strong and stable government, as uh, the uh, late Prime Minister used to say, um, then you can be an optimate. And the populares on this view are uh, just rabble-rousers, they're demagogues, they stir people up for their own interest. So we've got the bonny, who are conservative aristocrats in general, and then we've got the super bonny, the extra good people, the optimates, and they're kind of the leaders of the bonny, and they're really out to promote the status quo, to, to, to shore up and protect their own power and squash challenges which comes, come towards the supremacy of the Senate. Now, Cicero says that the populares are just rabble-rousers, and he says that the optimates is a broad church that can include anybody. Um, that's a rather specious argument. Um, it is certainly true that uh, optimates in theory, could include anybody. If you, if you, in the, you know, let's say the the, the very bottom uh, echelons of Roman society, but you believe in stable government by the Senate, and you're prepared to carry on tucking your forelock and uh, let the aristocracy run things, then you can self-identify as an optimate. But Cicero's idea that the Senate is open to all, as he he says, uh, is 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 a, a com is a complete fantasy. And almost all the people who are called or who self-identify as optimates as senators, with very few exceptions, who are also very rich members of the aristocracy. As for the populares, um, they're not really a party. Well, there, there weren't parties in the Roman state. The optimates aren't a party either. They're a bunch of self-interested aristocrats who just believe in keeping things the way that they are. Uh, the populares aren't a, aren't a party either. They're, a, uh, they're not even a faction. There are a series of individuals who subscribe to very similar ideological beliefs. And we can, can go through what these are. Firstly, they subscribe to the idea of the sovereignty of the people. Popularis is a thing, an, 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 an adjective which means of the people, to do with the people. And the idea of the popularis is that the people are the state. The public land is the public land of the Roman people. The empire is the empire of the Roman people. Um, uh, even the name for the coinage it makes clear that it's, it's the coinage of the uh, Roman people. The Roman people, in fact, own everything. The armies are theirs. The empire is theirs. Uh, the benefits of empire ought to be theirs. The magistrates are only magistrates because the people have voted them. The laws are only laws because the people have passed them. Now, prior to the Gracchi in, in the 130s and 120s, the sovereignty of the people was largely something that had lip service paid to it. It didn't really manifest itself in politics. The Senate ran the show and the people uh, either were okay and put up with it or weren't okay but put up with it anyway. With the rise of the radical tribunes, in the 130s, popular sovereignty ceases to become a sort of theoretical concept. And politicians like the Gracchi and Clodius um, uh, later on uh, are trying to, to make this uh, concept of popular sovereignty real. So to make sure that the people actually take steps to pass laws or to reject them, that uh, it is giving instructions to the Senate and the people rather than taking instructions from them. So the basic driver where legitimacy and authority rests in the Constitution should be with the people, which of course poses problems for the old Polybian idea of uh, balance that, that I discussed previously. They also want to make sure that the people can uh, 
have access to transparent government, that they should know what the Senate is doing, that, and, and, and that the Senate should feel that it has a duty to give account to the people. And one of the uh, main trends in scholarship in the last uh, generation has been to pay attention to the enormous amount of time that Roman politicians spend talking to the people, particularly Fergus Miller um, in his book on the crowd in the late Roman Republic and uh, other scholars like Bob Morstein Marx and Henrik Muritsen um, have uh, paid a lot of attention to the incessant degree to which politicians of all sorts feel they have to justify what they're doing to the people and speaking in as, as, uh, assemblies called contiones. And in a sense, what the populares are doing is picking up on this and empowering it, expanding it, and using it much more in order to communicate. So there's a real uh, sense that communication is one of the things that's crucial here. Um, and communication involves telling people what's going on. Uh, Julius Caesar is, looks like a very popularist figure. And paradoxically, he's, he's not a tribune and can't be a, a tribune. But as consul, he publishes the acts of the Senate, the first time that they've been made available so that ordinary individuals can, can, can see, publish, pinned up on a wall accounts of what the Senate has been up to. So uh, it's about um, a popular sovereignty and popular accountability is the first thing. Popularist ideology is secondly about uh, transparency and accountability. And thirdly, it's about making sure that the people get the benefits of empire, uh, that they are able to access food uh, grain, that they're able to have the revenues of the empire, all the taxes that are extracted from the provinces, go towards improving the quality of life of the ordinary Roman people.